Thank you, Holy Spirit. We are going to go, we are starting where we stopped last week at page 74 of our book, The Ladder of Success in Ministry. The Ladder of Success, we start at page 74 where we stopped last week. Hallelujah. Mazuko Torobo. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. So today we are going to start at page 74. Let us pray. The Bible says the entrance of the word bringeth light and understanding to the simple. Lord, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Amen. Let the word that we hear now not be an enticing word of a man, but let it be the word of God that will bring glory to thy holy name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We, we started talking about cell group last week. Cell what a cell group is to us that are Christians and the, how the cell group can help the, the big organization, which is the church, to grow. So we talked about the cell group being um, a, a, a small group. It can be a group of three, four, five, six, but at least when the group gets to 12, including the, um, excluding the host. So the host is going to be the 13th person. So if you have 12 leaders, then the group you have 12 leaders and two adults also added to the group they have 14 plus the host that's 15 so now you start to make plans to get to the next um, cell group sometimes you can have 20 people in a cell if nobody have taken up the responsibility to start a cell group as god gives you the grace to grow in the name of jesus christ so we are going to continue where we stopped that day. Um, we, we, we talked about the importance of cell. I think that was where I ended. Um, why the cell is very, very necessary for church, every organization. This is the government of 12, the government of Jesus Christ, the government of God. That's why we are reading a book called The Ladder of Success, G12. That G, the word G is government, government of 12. 12 months in a year. 12, um, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night, 12 um, um, tribes of Israel. And when Jesus came, he called his 12. God used the number of 12 to form his government. And we have 12 elders in the heavenlies. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 19, he said, when Jesus, when Peter asked him a question, say, we have left all and followed you. What shall be our reward? He said, those of you that have left family and all that, shall inherit a hundredfold but those of them that were looking at him he said you shall be judges with me and there were 12 so plus him he's going to be 13 so there will be 12 judges with jesus we already have 12 elders that are with god so that's the government of god 12. so how do we grow a, a church we start the church organization which is the, the 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 main the main the main the main place but it branched out through cell and in that you start to have cells develop Brother Charles, I'm going to bring you up. If you want to come on, you can accept it and it will bring you up here. Hallelujah. I think the camera is not working. Mazuko Torobo, Lakata Shikataba. In the name of Jesus. 74, we are going to read the success of a church is in the cell. Not that if the church doesn't have a cell group, it will not grow. But if you want to grow fast, when you start to have leaders, because in leadership, once a leader can be able to duplicate itself, that leadership will have a footstool in that area. In any kind of leadership, whether in a business leadership or in a, in a religious leadership or in a government of the people leadership, you can't lead alone. It is almost impossible. Man was created to work with other men. That's why God said it is not good that the man should be alone. So once you begin to develop leaders in an organization, then you are ready for a great harvest. Because every leader comes with a different kind of style, a different kind of potential, a different kind of knowledge. And with all those flavors, you start to make a great harvest. So this, the, successful, the success of a church is in the cell, in the, in the small groups that you have in the church, in every church or every organization. When a church walks with the cell vision, the result reflects numerically 
and the is the successful is successful because it is easy to train disciples and to go out and share the gospel so when you have a cell in the cell is where you develop relationship in fact this week one of our daughters called me and said i want to find out what does the cell mean she said she was on the bible studies last week but she didn't understand what that cell meeting was but until i posted a picture where i went on a cell meeting last week I think it was on Sunday, and then um, we had a fellowship. One of our members here, she had her family came, and they were about to leave back to Florida. So she has invited us, but I told her I'll be able to meet them on Sunday. We went and we had a great time with them that Sunday. Home. It was a very, very awesome meeting. It was very, very eye-opening. Many of them were opening up. It was easy to minister to people where you have them in a small group. So sales start with like, a man and a woman, you can pay for. The ideal number is six. Once everybody can duplicate themselves, that you have hit the number of 12. Plus the host, which is the 13th person. Then when the cell exceeds that 12, then you are beginning to make plans for another cell. You can still be in one cell until you get to 20, then the, the cell will break out of itself and begin to have a new cell. And that is how it just keeps going. And if you have five, six, seven cells, then you, you are talking about real harvest in the church because now everyone in a cell know each other. They know their, their challenges and they pray together. They have people that watch their back. They watch other people's back. So it's kind of a family. And it makes the church to be relatable because if you have a church of 100, for instance, or 200 people, and the pastor is just there like an island, even if you have one or two leaders, the, the impact will not be as much as if you have a church of even 50 that have two or three cells in that 50, the impact of that church in the next two, three, four, five months or one year, the church of 200, the harvest that they will record will not compete with the church of 50 that started with 50 in the same time. This church will grow past that number, but all, not only that, but they will have committed people to the vision. They will have committed people that have developed relationships because everyone in the cell knows everyone's challenges, knows their prayer requests, knows their children's birthday, um, their, their, their sorrows, like somebody passed away. It's easy for the cell group to come together and say, we have to go and see this sister, this brother, and pray with them and console them and stay with them. Then before the big church will get involved, then it is, it is easier for things to be done fast. So that's why I say that the success of a church is in the cell, different cells that you have. Then um, the next thing we are going to talk about, the cell gives everyone individual attention. Like I, I talked about having a church of 50 people. So 50 people and you have one or two or three leaders, then the attention span will be very, very low because everybody is trying to get to the leader. But if you have three cells in a 50 people church, each leader of the cell have an assistant. So let's say you have three cell group of 12 people. 12 by three is 36. Then, plus the pastor himself, that's about 37, plus the three leaders for those three cells, that's about 30, that's about 40. So in those 40 people now, everyone have an assistant. So now we are talking about 40 people, but you have at least about eight to 10 leaders that are already working actively in ministry, in ministration, in prayer, in counseling, in all that. They are training leaders. So before you know it, the whole of the 40 becomes leaders. And as the cell group begins to break out and have other cells, and that's how you start to invite people into the cell, and these cells you start beginning to break out and have other cells, and the cells begin to grow. Before you know it, you take over the whole city. The mathematics is not all that hard, but it's just the commitment. If once we are committed to do it, we can do it. Hallelujah. Jesus' main concern was not supply, not on, sup on the supply of the need to the people around him. He developed his ministry by being with the people in the book of Mark. The Bible say, it says, and Jesus, when, let's see, Mark, Mark chapter 6, let me read it here from the Bible. Mark 6, 34. It was easy for Jesus to minister to 12 people, very, very easy. Mark 6, 34, you can write it down. The Bible said there, and Jesus, when he, he came out, saw much people, 
and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd and he began to teach them many things when jesus saw people by this time there was no organization he came out and began to teach them immediately the salvation helped us to follow jesus step even a new believer can invite their families in a home where the cell leader can pay attention to each person in the same way that the pastor could do. So the cell leader becomes has responsibility now. So I'm talking to you now. If God is leading you to start a cell on your phone, start a cell with your iPad, you know, since we don't gather in a, in a, in a place anymore, we can do it virtually and, and like we are doing now. You have a cell meeting, three, four, five people that you hold accountable. You gather once a week. It can be Saturday, it can be Monday, it can be any day. It can be midnight, it can be whatever. You just come there for one hour, pray, introduce yourself, talk about what everybody is going through, find out what challenges that are happening, begin to pray for each person, and everybody have everybody's back. You begin to hold each other accountable. Then it is easy to have the church implementation happen because the cell group is where the foot work is done that is where the foot soldiers are that's where everything is going on amen let's move on we are in page 75 of the ladder of success now it is exciting when a pastor can help the entire church enter a cell vision the results are amazing this man that wrote this book started a cell vision when i'm going to tell you his story the Saturday church was about 120 members for about six years. He was tired and almost was quitting because the church was becoming um, what's draining from him. But when he began to call it, as God opened his eyes and showed him about the salvation, they moved in less than six months to one year. They had a hundred and something thousand people. They, are, they have branches spread out from their city and to other countries. By the time he wrote this book, they have more than 1.3 million people all over the world. The cell group just made the church to become, because people start to shoot out cell in different South American countries, from Brazil, they went to Colombia, to Argentina, Guatemala. They just keep spreading Mexico. They came to America. It's, it's an amazing story when you hear it. But what it is, is calling leaders and leaders who call leaders. That's what Jesus did. Jesus never ministered to 5,000 20,000 people. He ministered to them like preaching to them. It took time to minister to 12 men. Those 12 men are his core leaders. Those 12 men have their 12 men. When you see when Jesus died and there were 120 people gathered in the upper room, those people that were gathered in the upper room, they were all leaders. The, the needy people in church, the 5,000 and 10,000, the 4,000 people that came and ate bread and Gone because they have not been, they don't have responsibility. So cell group gives you responsibility and makes you to understand the vision and how to carry the vision and run with it. Because the Bible says, write the vision, make it plain that he that will come will run. There's going to be a manual now because now the church has a, a prototype in the cell. And from there you grow and you just see great things and great miracles begin to happen. Amen. Look at the cell at the backbone of a church. When you have a cell group, maybe a church of, let's say a church of 50, you have three cell groups. God bless you, sister. Maureen Brown, you are welcome. That group of 50, you have three cell groups in it. That church is fortified. It's, it's very, very strong. Because in those three cell groups, that means you have about six leaders in the cell group. And probably the six leaders plus the pastor and his assistant so the church of 50 have about eight leaders that are active. And we're not talking about now other leaders in the youth department, leaders in the choir and all that. I'm just talking about every leadership and assistant that is in the cell group are also leaders in the church. That is how it kind of translates. And it goes from there. Each cell evangelize and win new people. The new people then become members of the cell and are taught and prepared to be a tool in the hand of God, those members can now serve and become individual 
and become involved in different church departments. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10. The Bible said here, But the God of all grace, who had called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that we have suffered a while, makes you perfect, establish you, strengthen you, and settle you. There is a time of suffering and perfection. But God takes care of that. Once we can be able to put the structure, because this is, I'm telling you, as long as we are Christian and continue to be Christians, this is the way to go. You have to be a responsible Christian. You know, I talked in the morning about are you childish or mature? Sometimes when you listen to that message, it's like I'm talking to somebody, but I was talking to myself. That message is all about you holding yourself accountable. Am I still being childish? Or am I taking responsibility? When you are matured, maturity is not in age. Maturity has to do with responsibility that you take over and you occupy and you begin to do. And when you are a leader of a cell, you are responsible for people's life, for souls. And those souls, you will give account of them to God, not even to the pastor. And those souls now, you will help them to know that same God that you have known. It's not enough to just know God and fellowship in a church or in a Christendom and just enjoy the presence of God and the glory of God and the wealth of God and the long life and all the things that comes with serving God without really being on the field. So cell is a very great place to start. Once we start a cell group individually, you will start to see the, 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 the gift of God in you begin to manifest easily. Most times in the church setting, sometimes it's hard for us to get attention or to get to be able to do what God has called us to do. But in these little groups, now you are the leader, or you are an assistant, or you are part of the leadership. It, it, it gives you the, 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 the ability to minister to people and understand them. And you start to see God will begin to expand the grace that he has put in you. But the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ, he called everybody. I told you that God has called everybody. But until you accept the calling, then you cannot be chosen. Hallelujah. The Bible says that God is calling us. But if you accept, you say, who shall I send and who shall go for us? Until you say, here I am, send me. God will not send you. Once you say, I'm, I'm going to take up this responsibility, then you are now sent. You are now chosen. Hallelujah. The chosen is you that will accept it. Many are called, but few are chosen. How do you get chosen? By taking up responsibility. Hallelujah. Who shall we send and who shall go for us? I told us last week, we read it in Isaiah. I think Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 or Isaiah chapter 8 verse 6. You can Google it. He said, who shall we send and who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Once you say, here I am, send me, then you are chosen. Amen. Look at the cell are like a mine full of di diamonds where you will find leaders. There is no way to make a leader. You don't see somebody on the street that say, hey, this is a leader. People sometimes can look like a leader. They are not. Remember in the case of um, David and his brothers, the prophet, when he came to the house of David, the house of Jesse, the Bible says he saw his brother, Eliab. Say, wow, this one is very, very matured. He's in the military. He has all the six packs. He's tall. He's huge. He has muscles. He has pipes. He has all that. And the man of God looked at his body building and said, wow, what a great king. And the moment he wanted to pour the oil, the oil seized. God said, I have not chosen him. And seven brothers who look like the, the first passed by. And God said, I'm not looking at the way you look. The leader is not here. Go get him. Thank you, brother Charles. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. Who shall we send? Who shall go for us? Then you say, God, here I am. Then immediately the grace of being chosen will come upon you. And people say, oh, when will God choose me? No, 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 you have to accept it. It's a responsibility that has been given to every believer, every Christian. God is calling you. Say, here, who shall we send and who shall go for us? Until you say, here I am, send me. Nobody will send you. If somebody send you by their outward appearance, you might not get to the 100% because you are doing it because of that man, that woman, because of that person. It's like, you are, you are, this man is just bugging me every time he's calling. No. Once you say, here I am, it's a responsibility. You say, here I am, send me, then you begin to go. So the Bible says, someone looked at the brothers of David, they looked like kings, but they were not kings. It's not in the outward appearance. It is in the David was a responsible son. He was already in the field, taking care of sheep at this time. 
When every young man wants to go into the military, it's a cool thing to be in the military. You, you know, as a young man, that's it's a cool thing. You come back, you get respect. People value you in the society. You know, that you're in the military and you wear the uniform. David was not aspiring to be in the military. He was aspiring to take care of his father's sheep. And God saw his heart. And God chose him. Amen. So cell is that place. A cell is like a diamond. It's like a mine. Like a minefield. Full of diamond where you will find leaders. And those leaders can be now groomed. The cell is a great place to of formation for leaders and the place where you can pick your 12 and the people that are successful and fruitful are the ones you want to have on your team of 12. Your 12 are the leaders are a leader team that will help you in your ministry. Look at Jesus Christ when he did his own um, 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 peak in Luke chapter 6. If you look at from verse 12, we are just going to rush through it. We are not reading everything. 12 to 17, the Bible says, and it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when he had, when he, when it was day, he called his 12 and of them he chose 12 whom also he named as apostles. He called the disciples, they, everybody came, but from the disciples he called, he chose 12 people. So when he came down from mountain, the first thing is to pray. You have to have divine direction. You don't just begin a cell because you are excited. Yes, you can be excited, just go and pray. So God, give me, ex give me the grace to be able to handle the harvest or to be able to handle people's temperament and the people's norms and beliefs and ideology and indoctrination because people are coming from different places. And sometimes you can say something and it offends somebody. And sometimes somebody can come with what they know and they want to bend you. So as a leader, you have to ask God for all the balances. When God has given you the grace, you ask him for utterance to speak the word. God will give you utterance. Once you begin to call for this invite, you invite a lot of people. You don't just invite 12 people. You can invite 100 people. You get 10. You say, wow, we're going. Then you take it from there. As the cell grows, you as the host... You are not counted. Once you get 12 strong men, you can have 20 people, but only 10 or 5 are strong. You don't have a strong cell yet. When you have 12 strong men, then from those 12, you can tell them, we have to break up. Since you are in the north, why not go northward and start another cell? That person will say, okay, let me pray about it and pray and God will give them an idea and say, okay, you can start. They start, then you go and help them to start to, to launch them. And that's how the church will start to branch out in different places. And all these cells that happen during the week will now gather back on Sunday. What a great harvest. There will be testimonies flying every corner. Let me tell you, the church cannot be fully effective if the church doesn't have little particles of groups and different groups of women and men and youth and all that. These are factions that God will begin to drop nuggets and drop things. And God will begin to choose men and fashion them and begin to grow them. And that's how you start to see the harvest expansion. Amen. So the Bible says Jesus began to call his twelve. The names of the twelve are there. And if you go down to 17, and he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of the disciples and a great what? Because now these twelve men have brothers and sisters. They have family members. They, have, they used to be in different businesses. They start to call the people in their trade. That's how the church grew. Jesus did not know the whole city at the same time. It is one man at a time. When he get this man, this man bring his brother, bring his family, bring the other person, and you see, when he came down, the Bible said, multitude, a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea, coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him, and he healed and to be healed of all their diseases. Now Jesus Christ has a team, a team that can be able to make this happen. These are the teams that go ahead of him sometime to a city and begin to do the groundwork and begin to talk about him that is coming and begin to prepare the people and all that. When Jesus comes, harvest will just start to happen. Miracles, signs and wonders. These are things that just happen easily because it's not about just one man. It's about the team. So no man becomes successful alone. You have to build a good team. You build a good team. To have success. We are now in page 76. Amen. 
if you have the book, if you are not following or just listen to us, we are talking about the ladder of success in ministry, the G12, government of 12, how God, Jesus Christ, was very successful in three years. He was able to create this movement that the whole world is seeing today. So Jesus went, Jesus won 12 men that would become his representative to the world. He spent time forming his character in them and sharing his vision with them so that they could give that vision to 12 other and multiply. So each person has the responsibility to get other 12. That's why when Jesus died, the Bible said there were 150 people in the upper room. I assume that everybody did a great job. It might not be like that. Hallelujah. God bless you, man of God, for joining us all the way from Abuja. So let's say there were 12 of them. So each person have their 12. Hallelujah. So if you look at it, if 10 people get 12, it's 120. So let's assume that some people had their six, some have 10, some have 12. But by the time Jesus died, after the church evaporated, the leaders that stayed with him were 120 men. You remember the first time that Jesus had 12 disciples and seven, 70 apostles. Before he even died, the 70 left him because they were not trained. When Jesus said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you my body to eat, these guys say, what is wrong? This man is a madman. The Bible said the 70 left him. They came to him and said, ah, who can take this? He said, he's going to eat give us his flesh and unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood you cannot be part of me and the 70 because they were not part of his core inner they didn't understand the left and jesus looked and saw the 12 was with him and he said what are you still doing are you not going to live with them and peter said master where are we going we don't have any other place to go but with you jesus was testing them so he knew that the 12 has already gotten the vision so by the time jesus died these 12 have their own leaders that they have called so the church was about 120 we have the church of 5,000, which is, if you put it in our context, so the 5,000 men can translate to about 20,000 people because in every organization, there were more women and children than men. So men are the last people to come in any gathering, anything. Men are the most, the, the, the hardest people to get, even in business. They have to see all the corners. They don't just go with emotion. They go with facts and data and numbers. But they were able to count 5,000 men and 4,000 men. These are basic people that come. We're not talking about the Joseph and the Matthias and the, and, the, and, and the Nicodemus. These are wealthy people that are not even coming. The Chuzana, the Uza, the people like what, um, what's he called? Um, Mazika Taraba, Zacchaeus. Those are people that don't show up during church services. They only support the ministry. Those are the wicked men that support the ministry with their resources. If you have seen one of my videos that is on YouTube, I'm talking about the three kind of men you need in your life. The righteous men are the ones that follow Jesus everywhere. They didn't have much to give him. Some of them do, like Mary Magdalene and the rest, they had. But very few people had resources to spend because their resources was owned by God. There's a wicked man and there's also the evil man. But we're not going there today. So we have all these people that are not fully involved. But the people that were involved, there were still up to 5,000 men. But when Jesus died, those 5,000 men disappeared because they didn't have the core of the ministry in them, that they have the vision of the ministry. So they, they, it was easy for the devil to sway them that Jesus was a criminal or was a thief or a liar or whatever they told them. And they left the ministry. But the, the 120 stayed. The core was 12. Jesus was able to train 12 men in his ministry of three years. 12, he put himself in 12 men. And those 12 men began to train others. God bless you, woman of God, all the way from Accra, Ghana. In the name of Jesus Christ. So you have to get your 12. Every Christian must have leaders. You have to first serve as a leader in a cell group or in a very small group in the church. Then you begin to form your own leadership. That's the way you have to grow the ministry. That's the way you can be able to be held responsible. So in the cell group, the, 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 the mother cell, the first group of the cell is called the mother cell. The mother cell will give birth to this daughter cell. Why is it called mother and daughter? Because women are the ones that give birth. So that's the word, the word is used in ministry. When you have a cell group, it has the mother cell, you have the daughter cell, and the daughter cell will have a granddaughter cell, and the cell will just keep growing from there. And the mother cell can have five daughters, can have six daughters. So the first cell group is called the mother cell. Then it has daughters, and the daughters will start to multiply from there. Each leader that opened up a cell is called another cell. It's a daughter cell. And that's how the cell, if you, if you have five cells come from one cell, group, then you are seeing that mother have given birth to five daughters. And if those other daughters have to have their own, they are granddaughters, this great granddaughter too. That's how it goes. 
And before you know it, you have taken over the whole city. Amen. The mother cell and the daughter cell. The daughter cell begins with some of the members from the mother cell. An idea, an ideal number to start a cell is six, but nobody starts with an ideal number. Ideal number is where you have six people say you can start. You can start a cell by yourself and your wife. At least if you have two people, yourself and your son or whatever, then the, your son will invite a friend and you, the other person invite their friends. Then the cell group is beginning to grow. So the ideal number is six. Once it gets to 12, excluding the host, the host is the 13th person. Once excluding the host, then you know the cell is up to capacity. But you don't just break the cell when it's 12. You start to invite more people. When the cell begins to grow to 13, 14, 15, 16, leaders that have been trained, I'm not talking about people that just came and see you today and they go the next day they come. No, when you start to have 13 people that are committed to that cell, 14, 15, then you start to talk among yourself, say, we want to break out, we want to have another cell. And from the, say, who is going to start a cell? You are in the north, you are in the south, you are in this area of town, area, and from there, somebody will take up the responsibility after you have prayed, and once they start, then the, the cell has given birth to a daughter, and it grows from there. Hallelujah. That's where multiplication is a result of two elements. The moment you start to have first generation and second generation in a cell, there's multiplication. That church or that organization will record success. This is not a, a, a magic. These are things that are practical. In fact, I've seen a ministry that when I was in South Africa, we were about 40 when I joined the ministry and the, the man of God, we had a great leadership team and we started to, before we, we, you know it today, the, the ministry have about other 16 or 17 branches just in South Africa. I'm not talking about in Nigeria, in Philippines and other places. These are people that we knew that we were all in the same ministry. Everybody knows each other. We start to do what we call massive evangelism because we're having meetings in different places and different locations. The church just break out you know, when you have the right people around you, there is no way success cannot be harnessed. In fact, success is inevitable once you have leaders because nobody grows in life without leaders. Jesus himself was God. He could have come and said, let me do it alone. It's not possible. He began to call people. And in his ministry for three and a half years, Jesus had only 12 members that he trained. 12. And some people are surprised when they hear that number. When Jesus was giving account to God, he said, all the people you have given to me, I kept except the son of perdition, who was Judas, that was also already predestined that he will be like that. So the whole 12, he kept all of them because he has been able to put himself inside of them. Amen. Multiplication is like the miracle of the fish and the loaves. A young boy had five loaves and uh, two pieces of fish. One loaf of bread was enough to feed a thousand people. If you read carefully, you will see the only, that only men were counted. So they, they had, they had more, more than the number that we saw. This is truly a miracle that only God could have performed. It is not possible to really have record that kind of result if God was not involved. But God was the one that could five loaves turn to five thousand men. Each loaf of bread feed a thousand. How did God do it? We didn't know. But it starts the, the miracle of multiplication. So when you start to have a cell group begin to break out and have other cell group, more will happen like this. And you say, what did these people do? It's nothing. It's just buying into the vision. Once you have to, the leader of the, the organization, the church, the pastor, like I'm talking to you, has to be a visionary and be able to pregnant the leaders that work with him with vision also. Once you can be able to pregnant them with the vision, that's it. They will give birth to the vision also. And those vision will give birth to the same vision. And that's how it begins to multiply. The purpose of a cell, a cell opens door for opportunities for our families to receive salvation. Every time you bring people group, it's easy for you to say, hi, how are you? Have you given your life to Christ? And they say, no, yes. Then you start to find out challenges in their life and you pray with them. It's easy to communicate when you have a small group in every organization. Organizations are broken down into small, small particles of groups. That's how organizations become effective. If you do organizational management, that's management was my major in school in business administration. 
when you don't, if you if you manage a large number of people, you can never be successful as a leader. You have to start. You have to have your core leaders, and you start to grow from there. They are people in the, your inner carcass, the people you brainstorm with, there are people that think with you, there are people that do things for you. There are different people for different assignments. Once you have them in leadership, then you are ready for harvest. You cannot begin to launch. Once you launch out, you know the group that will take over from this group and do the rest. So the cell, when the cell begins to break into cells, you are recording success. And that is where salvation will begin to happen People are giving their life to Christ in Lawrenceville. People are giving their life to Christ in Georgia. People are giving their life to Christ in Texas. You start to have different groups and there's record of salvation, record of healing, record of miracles in different places and the church will just expand shit. Amen. Number two that happened, the purpose of a cell. Cell allow people to have a relationship with someone in leadership. So if you are in a cell group and maybe you have never known any leader in an organization, then you are, you are leader of the group, the host. You are looking at them. You are seeing them. They are very close to you. They know your children's name. You know their name. You know their children's name. Sometimes you know their home. You know their birthday. You develop relationship with leadership. That same person you are seeing in the cell. On Sunday, maybe, maybe they have a bigger assignment in church. When you come now, you say, wow, this is our leader that we used to sit down in round table in their dining to just eat and talk and just pray together, cry together, and all that, encourage each other together. You see them in church. They are the one leading praise. They are the one doing and praise and worship. They are the one leading prayers. You are looking at them from afar, but you have close relationship with leadership. That, that is one of the greatest this thing. Let's go to um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. Matthew chapter 9, verse 10. We give you all the glory and adoration. We exalt, we magnify you. La Bobo Shakara Baba. Look at verse 10. The Bible says, and it came to pass as Jesus sat at the meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. It, 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 there was no way, it's almost impossible for these people to have seen Jesus because. Every time he comes out, this crowd of 5,000, 10,000 people, people are struggling too. But the Bible says, and it came to pass as Jesus sat down at meat in a house, house fellowship, as he was sitting, then these sinners came in and sat down and the, the rest happened. And when the Pharisees saw it and they said to his disciples, why eat your master with publicans and sinners? Why, why is he eating with sinners? His main purpose of coming there is to win their soul. He knows the strategy. Jesus was the chief strategist. He came and sat down in that house fellowship and began to evangelize and began to talk and begin to take questions from them. In the church setting, you can't take questions. There is no way, it's almost impossible for you to take questions in a very big setting like that. But in a cell group, you can have chit chat. You can have counseling with somebody, pray with them, and they start to say, oh, wow, that you see on TV, I've met him. I've seen him. I've had relationships, I've ate with him in the restaurant. And that's how all those things grow. Number three, the purpose of cell, the cell give people an opportunity to be touched by God. Give them an opportunity. There's an opportunity that is brought out in the cell. We can also open the book of Luke chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Luke 5. Mazuku Torabalika Tachakadaba. What a mighty God we serve. What a great God. Hallelujah. Look at verse 19. Jesus. You see, when they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the ties into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. And verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. This was the man that his friends brought in. And the Bible said that there was no way to come into the house. Jesus was in a very small house. The house was packed. But the Bible said they lowered him. So cell gives people opportunity to be touched by God. That man, if it was in a church setting, when thousands of people are lined up, where will they be able to carry him from there and bring him to the stage? It would be almost impossible. But Jesus was in the house. 
and the house was packed. They brought the man, they couldn't bring him through the door. They lowered him through the roof and Jesus touched his life and his life was changed. The cell group gives opportunities for such things to begin to happen, not just happen, but happen exponentially, greatly and mighty. I'm telling you these things as we are reading them, if we begin to practice it, if we begin to practice it, we are going to see some kind of result that we have not seen. And the opportunities are out there now. Now that the ministry has gone into media, gone into the virtual church that people can sit in the comfort of their home and communicate with somebody in very, very far. Right here we are now. We have people from Africa. We have people from Europe that are connected with us, South Africa and all that here in America and out of state. It is easy to start a cell group with people that are not even in the same state with you. And you, we, like we pray every evening, you have a cell group with them. Whatever time you, you, you gather, you tell them we are going to be gathering in the main church by 7 p.m. They should join us and hear from the leader. And once in a while, I will come into your cell meeting through virtual means also and minister to them and talk to them and know their names and all that. It is easy for great harvest. We just have to understand the formation of a cell and how to do it. The ideal cell. That's the next thing we're going to talk about before we pray. Amen. We just have about a couple of minutes to begin to pray. I think we're going to stop in ideal cell. Next week, we're going to talk about winning soul through cell. The ideal cell is a specific message for the homogeneous group. It is searching for example and message should be specific for men, women, young people, and children, depending on the cell group. So, Every cell group should have a specific message that you give. You don't just come to a cell and begin to throw all kinds of things. And I told you last week, cell is not a place to bring ideological differences and dogmas and doctrines. It's not a place to practice dogma. It's a place of salvation, a place of call, a place of acceptance, a place of relationship. All those things the people will learn as they begin to grow and begin to understand and come into the main church, they will start to understand who they are in Christ and what they're supposed to do. But the cell is a place to receive people, to hug them, to hear their story, tell them stories. Testimonies should be told with stories and things that have happened somewhere. You just say, this brother, last week we met them on the street. I remember in those days we were doing food soldiers in South Africa. We were bringing prostitutes to church. We were bringing people selling drugs, people who were drug addicts, people that were sleeping on the streets, homeless people. It was easy to get to them because we come to them, we listen to them, they cry, we cry with them. You know, we bring them to church and we begin to minister to them. They see a different kind of people. We go to the hospital and minister to people that are sick. We go to hospice. In those days, the HIV was one of the highest ravaging things in South Africa. We go to hospice, people that are dying. We go there and pray and we see a lot of people die that we have prayed for. But in that place, we saw people come out of hospice and give their life to Christ and came back alive. Their, their souls died. They came back and have life again. We recorded such miracles about three, either three or four, when I was in South Africa. But we saw more than 10 or 20 people die. But we meet them before they die. They give their life. They begin to regret everything they have done. We pray with them. We console them. Some of them, no family come to see them again. We go to prisons and begin to talk people in prison. When they are released from prison, they are joining church. You see, cell we open you up to ministry. When I say in church, we don't really do ministry. We come to church, we have fellowship and we leave. Ministry is the people out there, the sinners how you can be able to touch their life and begin to use stories of what happened to you, what happened to somebody, and begin to change their life. And those stories can be told in those small groups. Amen. This will allow each cell to teach its goal because of, be, and become responsible. Work as a team and find useful strategies. You know, in, in this, you just based on the need of the cell, you don't say what happened to the other cell, it will happen in this cell. No. The cell is formed based on the need of the people. So you can be able to meet their need in the name of Jesus Christ. And winning souls through cell, let's just finish it because it's just small and we're going to pray. Majority of decisions for salvation will be within the cell simply because they are the main channel through which the gospel reach the community. So useful strategies and uh, to accelerate the harvest of souls. Uh, number one is prayer. I told us, I remember in those days when we were doing selling, 
in South Africa, the, 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 the easiest thing to, to get somebody attention, you don't tell them who you are, you are a pastor, a bishop, an apostle. They don't care. They don't even want to know about that. I'm telling you, people don't want to care. People don't care how much you know, but they care how much you care about them. Not just how much you care, but about them. It has to be personal because these people are needy. They are selfish at the time you meet them. They don't care who you are. So you come. The, the best strategy that we use that have worked, and we are waiting for things to normalize, and many of you, I'm going to go out with you, and you start to see. You don't tell them anything. Hello, how are you? God bless you. Can I pray with you? People, some people have never had anybody pray for them or pray with them forever. Maybe it's a long time ago they have had success. They say, wow, pray for, okay. They let you pray for them. And as you begin to pray, God will put the words in your mouth. The Bible says, open your mouth and I will feel it. The moment you introduce prayer, don't telling them, oh, how destroyed they are, how sinful they are, or what they can do, they go to hell or go to heaven. No, you just say, can I pray with you? And maybe if you talk to five people, one person will say yes, or two will say yes, and you pray with them in the name of Jesus. You finish praying, you leave. They call you, say, bah. Say, who are you? And you say, oh, I'm this person, I'm brother, this, I'm sister, this. Oh, this, this is our flyer. Oh, you are a pastor, or you are a brother, you are from this church. Now they are, you get their attention. You pray for them, you didn't tell them any other thing, you move on. And you see them call you back. And you develop relationship because of your genuineness to their needs, because now you just came and met their need. Because the moment you open your mouth, God will begin to minister through you. The Bible said in the book of Romans chapter 8, it says, we know what, not what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession with groanings that can never be uttered from us. As we open our mouth, the Holy Spirit begins to interpret and begin to make uh, intercession and begin to pray according to the needs of that, pe that person. Most times, some people, I'm just, just pray with them, God will begin to tell me about them. And as I'm praying, I'm talking. As I finish praying, before you finish, the person is already crying. Because you mentioned some things that they are going through, some things that have happened in their life. Father, help this brother, this sister in this area. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of rejection, every spirit of sin, every they, you just see them. There was one lady I prayed for, I think two months ago here in Atlanta, I met her downtown and we were talking, talking, talking. Then I said, I want to pray with you because I'm about to leave. I, I was in a gas station and she started talking to me and she was asking some, some questions. And I know she didn't want, she wanted to ask for money or something. But when we started talking, I started praying for her. She began to cry. I started to pray for every spirit of rejection. I said, I come against this. I didn't know who she was. I've never seen her anywhere. And she started to cry. I said, how do you know that everybody have, even her daughter threw her out? When I was speaking to her, she was trying to go back to another state. And after that, she was waiting for her bus. She went back to the bus station. When she traveled, she called me back. She told me how her journey was. She was so excited. Say, anytime I come to Atlanta, I will visit you all. Just prayer. Just prayer. God told me that she has been rejected. I have never seen her before. I come against every spirit of alcoholism. You see people begin to melt because now you are ministering to them. These things can be possible when you start to do cell group. People come in, they're happy, there's food, there's cake, there's something, and they're happy because of all those things. But in the mix of that, God will open your eyes. And many of you don't know what abilities you have until you jump into the pool. God will start to use you mightily, massively. Things, things you never knew you can do begin to happen. There is no way to know God unless you begin to do this. We have prayed, we have prayed, we have prayed, we have prayed. It's time to get out. God is still saying, who shall I send and who shall go for us? It's an open invitation. He never called a particular person and said, come, come. Very few people got arrested on their way. But many times when God threw that call out and you say, Lord, here I am, send me. The spirit of God will take over your life. The rest chapter of your life, God will write it. You will never be able to say how, it, how you got to where you got. You never was that person, but you just took a decision of faith. And God began to amplify your footstep. The four men that were just about to die by the gate of Samaria, the Bible says, they say, if we stay here, we die. Go to our brethren, we die. Let's go into the camp of the Philistines. If they kill us, we die. If they leave us, we stay. They took that step. They didn't know that the word of God had preceded them. There was a prophecy that by tomorrow, the corn of flour shall be sold for nothing. But the moment they did that, God began to amplify their footstep. Many of you that are listening to the sound of my voice now, God is waiting for you to take that step. 
and you can start a cell on your phone. Start a cell with your Facebook group. Just start a cell. It doesn't matter what it is. And let God begin to hold you responsible for people and see God move in your life. And your life will never be the same again. Amen. We are going to pray now. Next week, we are going to continue from where we stopped. Next week, we are just going to continue on soul winning two cells and all the strategies that are there. And we stop at page 78 of the ladder of success, G12. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your sons and your daughters. Unfortunately, we didn't have a face-to-face, -face, so we would have had some questions. But if you have any questions, you can still write me. And we are going to be able to explain some things to you that you don't understand. But I want us to have, by next week, let somebody tell me I have started a cell with my sister, my brother. I, can, I have started a cell with my friend, with my family there in South Carolina. I do Zoom meeting with them once a week. You can start with somebody in Washington, D.C. You can start with somebody in South Africa, in Nigeria. You can start with somebody in London. You start with somebody. You just have a Zoom. You have a conference with them. And you talk. You teach that Bible. You start with how is you doing, how is your family, and all that. What is God doing in this season in your life? How is COVID-19? All that. Then you go straight and share the word. And you will be surprised. The abilities that will begin to come out of you. If you take this responsibility and try God with this, see what God will do. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Father, I pray for your son and your daughter. Lord, we thank you for the word that we have spoken. It's not our word. These are the word of God. Let this word profit us. Let the word begin to multiply. Let the intended result for this word come to pass in our lives. Everyone that have heard me, that have written something, that have told something, as you begin to minister to them today, Lord, give them the grace to begin a sale. A cell that will multiply and turn to a great harvest to the church. And, you are, and you are, their lives will never be the same again. Lord, I pray for every soul that is connected today that want to be a born again. Either for the first time or for the tenth time they have been in God and they are backslidden and they are coming back. Lord, we welcome everybody. No soul shall be left behind. If you are here, you want to give your life to Christ or rededicate your life. I want you to say after me, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. I believe with my heart that you died for my sins and resurrected for me. Jesus Christ, come into my life. I confess with my mouth that you are my personal Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, come into my life. Congratulations, you are born again. I want you to find a Bible-believing church that fuse yourself in. Your life will never be the same again. God bless you. This Sunday, our flyer will be out either today or tomorrow, but I'm going to post it out. We are going to have a parking lot service on this Sunday. We will bring out our speakers and all that in front of the church. We are going to just, if you want to come, you can come, you can still watch us online. So we still have the live stream. So whichever one is comfortable for you, if you just want to fellowship, you can just come and stay in your car and we will have a parking lot service. We are going to speak, our speakers will be blowing out on the streets here in Pleasant Hill. Everyone will hear us loud and clear. Our service will start 11 o'clock on the dot and everything will happen in that one hour. Both praise and worship, prayers, all that, the whole night you preaching. And we just do it this Sunday and see how God is going to take us. That's where God is leading us now. And we'll see how we're going to go. By the time things normalize, we'll see where we are. So we are starting our service on Sunday at the parking lot. We are going to be singing and praising God. And we are going to just go and let God be God. And our voice shall be heard in the whole of this area. I know that when that speaker is going to blow there, people will hear us up to half a mile or even up to one mile. In the name of Jesus Christ. And we are going to bring great harvest to the, to, to the kingdom of God. And I want you to invite your friends to just say, let's drive up to church. And you just stay in your car for just one hour. And your life will never be disappeared. 11 o'clock in the morning to 12. And if you can come, God bless you. You can still watch us. Connect also on our Facebook page. And we are just going to have a great time on Sunday. And we are going to announce it tomorrow. So if the flyer comes out, share it to somebody. If you're out of state, some of you, you that are partners that are out of state, Connect the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern time. We will be live on Facebook and your life will never be the same. God bless you. Bless you very well. I love you with all my heart, but above all, Jesus loves you the more. I'll see you tomorrow. God bless you.